I always say that I started doing my work in the street because it was my way to heal my relationship to society. I needed to mm, see how I wow. felt inside, mm -hmm. outside of myself, mm -hmm. because I was starting to question even reality in a way. People really pictured me as this like super angry, loud, frustrated feminist. And after me too, people are like, oh, okay. Again, you know, like if someone just gives you the dignity of listening to your actual context, you're perceived differently. What's up, lovely human, and welcome to That's Exciting, the podcast. I'm your host, CNC, a curious soul who loves to learn about intimacy, relationships, and sexuality. Speaking of learning, I started my semester at Concordia University in interdisciplinary sexuality studies. So I'm all for grasping more knowledge and having more of these conversations around these topics. So this week, as you saw in the title, we're talking about, of course, sex, but also art and feminism with one of my favorite visual artists, Miss Me Art. To bridge with last week's episode, Sexual Assault and Healing with Queer Trauma Specialist Gemanika Eborn, the discussion about sexual assault is furthered in today's episode. Last week, Gemanika said... Therapy is not the only way that you can navigate things. Talk therapy is not the only way. You are also allowed to break up with your therapist if it's not a good fit. You are also allowed to break up with your therapist if it is not a good fit. <laughs> There's other modalities, somatic therapy, where we're literally working on our bodies. That's what I want you to know. There are options. And if I'm completely honest, I am still oblivious to, you know, talk therapies alternatives. Now, you're probably wondering why and how does Miss Me, visual artist, ties into alternative therapy? Well, during a conversation, she said, I always say my work is my therapy and image because mm -hmm. I go to therapy and honestly, It's like an illustration of my shit, <laughs> like for real. I always say that I started doing my work in the street because it was my way to heal my relationship to society. And I thought this was a great opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about art therapy, specifically visual art therapy. And to further our understanding and knowledge of what art therapy is, we are joined by art therapist Andrea Cook. Andrea Cook has an integrative and inclusive French and English art therapy practice. Intimage, aimed at individuals and couples struggling with emotional health, life transitions, intimacy, and the impact these have on relationships in Montreal. She helps people develop concrete, creative tools to transform their relational self and express their hearts. So, what is art therapy? Art therapy is a way of engaging in your nonverbal communication. So inside all of us, we're born long before we have language and words, this ability to communicate through mark making, through movement. So art therapy really takes advantage of that because if you've ever had a moment where you're like, oof, trying to talk about the way that you feel and you're like, it just, it doesn't come up in words. I don't know, I don't know how to say it. That is something that art therapy can address directly. And you go in, you work with your body and symbols and express the emotion in a different way until you find the words that you're comfortable with and safe with. There's something called creative arts therapies and expressive art therapies. I work a lot with art, so visual art. I work a lot with photography. That was my career before I became an art therapist. There are also other types of creative arts therapists who work in music, who work in movement. There are some of us like me and the expressive arts therapists that incorporate more than one, we call it a modality. So whether it's visual arts, dance, There's actually a lot of neuroscience and cognitive research. There's a lot of benefit from just bottom up. Bottom processing is the information that you get from your environment that elicits an emotion, then stimulates your rational brain and you can make rational decisions. And so art, you're moving into your body and you're creating an emotional experience to be able to make sense of it. Even just the pure benefit of being able to create and disengage our rational brain, because we're always thinking up here in our Western culture, and that's very rational and in your frontal lobes. And so art can just even be able to get rid of and out of that frontal lobe space and come into your body and express and enjoy the pure creation moment. I think this is a comment that 
I can certainly say it from my perspective, and you read about it a lot in the research, is that almost every art therapist with their client at some point hears, oh my gosh, I forget just how good it feels to just play with clay, to just be in the moment. As mentioned earlier, we're furthering last week's conversation around sexual assault. So how can art therapy help someone who deals with trauma and or has been sexually assaulted? I'll leave it up to Andrea. So already it is a really sensitive, difficult topic. I mean, some people have been through really intense experience regarding their sexuality and their love lives. And when trauma comes into the mix, sometimes there are words that are too difficult to even speak. And so in art therapy, we throw that away. We get rid of the word that is just too threatening to even say and explore it in a totally nonverbal way. So getting that body in there, looking at images. And then my role as an art therapist is to really help people understand what's going on and what's being activated and what their bodies are telling them. Because often what happens too with trauma survivors is that there's a lot of dissociation. So the body is not connecting with the emotions because at some point that had to be severed or broken, right? And so being able to come back and trust what your body is telling you and link that feeling to what is going on emotionally and then understand when that's triggered in your present day life. An art therapist will walk you through these really concrete ways of putting it onto a piece of artwork, right into a third space, which is way less intense than having to find that word and talk about it with somebody in front of you. And then to be able to go in and piece apart, okay, how is this connected to what I'm feeling? We can actually go in and map out what's happening in the body when it gets re-stressed. From there, that creates a visual impression that people can draw on when they start to notice these things happening outside of the art therapy space too. It's a little bit of a two-way stream. You put it into the artwork and it helps you step back to be able to even start to feel. And then you can understand what your body is telling you because our bodies have all sorts of sensations that come up when we're feeling something. And then be able to go in and then feed back more desirable or positive experiences instead of the negative ones. So that's one really easy, quick example of how everybody can, can benefit from the mind-body relationship. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing your knowledge and expertise about art therapy with us on the podcast. You can follow her on Instagram and Facebook at Aintimage Therapy. All information's in the show notes. And now, without further ado, I had the honor to sit down with, as I said in the beginning, one of my favorite visual artists, Miss Me Art. An activist, feminist, and one of the most recognized outlaw artists in North America, Miss Me's unapologetic pieces command attention in sharp tones, exploring her own struggles with race, gender, society, and class while uplifting icons of the past. Her compelling, elegant, and sometimes unsettling large-scale sweets pastes swallows building holes, confronting issues of dignity and forcing us to reconsider our own truth. Rarely in any city for more than a few months at a time, the Artful Vandal has channeled the momentum of the art's global success towards a new movement, passionately advocating for women as role models and pivotal members of their communities. If you have access to your phone right now, I would recommend you either going on Google, Instagram, or Twitter and searching Miss Me in order to see her work and familiarize your eyes so you may have another layer of understanding uh, during our interviews. So for Instagram, it's Miss underscore me underscore art. For Twitter, it's The Artful Vandal. And if you go on Google, you can just write The Artful Vandal or Miss Me Arts. So today, as mentioned earlier, we furthered last week's conversation around sexual assault. We talked about women's sexuality being wrapped in shame, understanding that our bodies are not the problem, and meeting our own patriarchal mindset. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. And now, without further ado, let's jump right in the icebreaker of the show, The Sexual Green Flags. For the new listeners, sexual green flags are indicators that you'll have pleasurable, consensual, and safe sex. Someone's smell? Mmm. 
Yeah, that's a big one. Someone smells good. That's a green flag. If someone, if I'm not too sure, even if it's a cologne, I'm not down with. Eh. But then it's obviously it's a vibe, and it's the way someone just presents to you. If the person is like, will do moves, yeah. but won't impose moves. And also like wittiness, like uh, intelligence, like back and forth. Mm -hmm. I feel that's like a good, obviously you can never know until you have sex. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. There's, we can say all these things about everything. The truth is you'll never know until you actually physically do it. Mm -hmm. Even if you've done it like online video, mm -hmm. even if you've written, even if you've made out Yo, you can make out with someone and it's amazing and then you have sex and it's so disappointing. True that. It's like very bizarre because it's actually different things, right? Like mm -hmm. someone can be very like sure of themselves when you're making out and then the second it has to do with everything else and a lot of I'm 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 straight so mm -hmm. I have sex with men. And it's funny I feel like some men get in their head too when it comes to like having sex and mm -hmm. you can tell right away and they become self-conscious. Like we talk a lot about women being self-conscious, but yes. guys can get self-conscious. The performance as well goes for men as well. I remember this one guy. It's, I mean, to, at the end of the day, it's a vibe. Odor and a vibe. <laughs> 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 this one guy, I remember like we met mm -hmm. and he touched my hand and he just held my hand. Oh, I'm so happy to meet you, blah, blah, blah. He held my hand and I was like, oh, I'm gonna fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> his hands were like wow they're like i remember i remembered his hands more than his face at that point hmm. and we did end up having sex and it was amazing was it the grip was it the the, the he, shape? he had like really was big it? hands like very strong grip but mm -hmm. soft really soft skin it was you know that perfect oh. mix you know what i mean yeah yeah assertive <laughs> but like gentle and like soft but like mm, a great like, balance yeah. a good yeah. balance and staring at your eyes at the same time Eye contact. I like eye contact in general, even during sex. The whole being in the dark and closing your eyes is... I want to see your face. Like, even though you may think your face looks weird, I want to see it. It does look weird. So that's the yeah. thing. Like, we have, you have to But let go. But I don't care about that. I'm just like, this is really vulnerable. Like, your face, my face is ugly. I don't, I'm not like, uh, no. I'm going to make some weird, cringy ass faces and we're going to share that moment and it's going to be great. Yeah, but like, what's, what's beautiful during sex and in society are two different criterias too. Yeah. So yes, it would be ugly if we had to take a picture of the moment and put it on a magazine. <laughs> Probably a bad idea. But in that moment, that's what I've learned, like, you know, through my life, through sex, is that a lot of stuff that we think is not pretty is actually super exciting. Mm -hmm. The things we are we we are self-conscious about is what is exciting. The mm -hmm. weird face, the 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 jiggling boob, the jiggling fat, like sometimes the sweat. Yeah, the, all that uh, stuff yes. that you're like, ooh, no, that is what is actually exciting for your partner. And that's why for me, like the eye contact makes it like you're really present. Like to mm -hmm. really be there in that bizarre moment makes it more to me it's more intimate. And that's what makes it more close. Mm-hmm. I want to start the interview with an excerpt from a quote. To be born in a woman's body is to bear the unsolicited burden of humanity's unresolved attitudes towards sex. She learns to adapt to a patriarchal system that blames women for the misbehavior of men. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been saying that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And since Me Too, people get it. Most of my work, since Me Too, I don't have to explain Before Me Too, oh my goodness. There was a lot of conversation around it. People just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. They were like, but why? Aren't you exaggerating? People really pictured me as this like super angry, loud, frustrated feminist. And after Me Too, people are like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, like if someone just gives you the dignity of listening to your actual context and accepting it, mm -hmm. you're perceived differently because you understood within your context. And that's yes. what Me Too did. Like mm -hmm. people started believing women being like, oh, okay, maybe you're right. Maybe your whole understanding of your entire life, I should listen to. Maybe I don't know better. Yeah. You know, and we see that not just with like women in general, but like all the different categories within women. The, interse so, the intersectionalities as yeah, well. So it's a hard word to it say. Is. It's a good <laughs> word. It's an important word. It's it really is. hard to say. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that's a phrase that I really that matters to me. Mm -hmm. The burden because it feels heavy. It is heavy, and it ends up being internalized shame and feeling like you're wrong for existing in your body. Well, the thing is, I I've always said since the very beginning, and I think that's why pretty quickly a lot of men started following me mm -hmm. because there's a 
Weird misunderstanding that feminism is against men. Patriarchy is not men. It's a mentality. Mm -hmm. Feminism fights a mentality and that mentality. I actually started what I did because I was having conversation within me. This is me battling myself, mm -hmm. my own patriarchal thinking, my own prejudice against myself. Mm -hmm. So it's not against someone. It's against a, a way of thinking that is ingrained in our societies. Yes. But it's also really a mentality. Mm -hmm. So that's why, yes, we, it will be against ourselves. To me, that's the number one battle that I'm fighting. Mm -hmm. First of all, because I'm privileged enough there's a, that there's a lot that I don't have to fight. But also because, I mean, I'm, I think way too much. So I try to, my, my battles happen a lot within myself. So a lot of my work is really about that. And I think, as you said, it's internalized in a lot of women yes. in a bunch of different ways. And the only mm -hmm. way to, to start dealing with it is to name it, is to share it, to make it real for others and for ourselves outside of ourselves, the power of the word. Mm -hmm. Once you do that and you share it and you realize you're not the only one, that will help with the whole shame thing. Shame is a powerful, paralyzing tool. Yeah. And it's the oppressor's best tool. It's once they left, they don't even need to be there anymore. You're doing it yourself. So much around women's sexuality is or like is wrapped in shame. And my reflex is to go peek, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I always write like, good girls don't make a fuss. Because I was taught that. Don't mm -hmm. make a fuss. It's probably you. Take it. Keep it. It's not elegant. It's not womanly. You should accommodate for other people. Yeah. yeah because yeah, that's yeah. what we're taught like, a, like to be a proper woman mm -hmm. is. That's what elegance is. No, that's not what elegance is. Mm -hmm. Elegance is something else. Mm -hmm. One of the, the pieces that people are really familiar with is the Portrait of a Vandal. So can you describe it a little bit for people that are listening right now? Portrait of a Vandal is an image of myself naked with a face that is frontal, mostly angry. Not all of them are, but they're, they're not seducing. They're not sweet. They're not smiling. They're mm -hmm. very confronting positions in ways or angry or yelling. And I always have a t-shirt that I'm pulling up, either showing both my breasts or one. And I'm completely naked. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's this mix of nudity that is not sexual, not in a seductive way, not mm -hmm. in a sexual way. And it's frontal confronting and angry. And the superposition of those two things bother people <laughs> because <laughs> those are not really allowed together almost. Like you cannot just be naked for just being. It has to be for a purpose. And that is something that for me, I needed to do because I was on one of them. I, it's written, stop blaming women for the misbehavior of men. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been, this has been one of the heaviest for me. I've always been, you know, more curvy, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I was always told by my mom, by anyone at school, by my boyfriends, by everything, don't go out like this. Or, or if men were looking at me, even like, like my parents' friends would look at me or do anything. It was my mom or anyone else would just, or their wives would just put the responsibility on me and shame me. Mm -hmm. Even when I was a kid, when I was 14 and, you know, you're starting to grow and your clothes start being too, too small, you know, and you don't like back in the day, we didn't have that much clothes. Like, you know, we didn't shop like now, like it was very different. So I had like, you know, our, this one specific story. We were going to this family friend's house and mm -hmm. I was, I think, 13, 14. So I was starting to, you know, grow breasts and everything and also still growing. And my mom would always buy me like uh, two outfits, like nice outfits a year, like one for summer and one for winter. Like, and mm -hmm. it was like a black skirt and a black uh, blazer. Mm -hmm. And she would have, right before that, she actually made it longer because I had grew. Mm -hmm. So she made the skirt a little younger and everything a little longer just so it fits because you're not going to just buy another one. Right. And that day when we went there and we came back, my mom was like telling me that uh, she was told by the hostess that uh, I was not going to be invited anymore uh, if I didn't learn how to dress properly. And my mom didn't even defend me. She just took it and just gave the shame to me when I was like, you bought me this outfit. Mm -hmm. You made it longer. I'm 14. I'm not responsible for her husband looking at mm -hmm. me. But I remember the shame. And that it's been feeling, like that yes. my entire teenage years and, and adulthood until even recently. But Canada really helped because Montreal is really much more open when it comes to women's sexuality. Like there's okay. much less judgment than Europe. Okay, um, interesting. But this has been super heavy for me. Mm -hmm. super heavy i would have thought the opposite just because for instance like my friend has traveled and they were like oh yeah we went to the beach topless and all the 
just through that lens, my thinking was Europe seems like it may be more open. It's super patriarchal. So they're they're more open about sex. Okay. It's less like stuck up. Mm -hmm. But a woman that has a lot of sex is in okay and is okay about it is still a slut. You have to hide it. There's ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. A girl that dresses a certain way and wants like like sexual attention because we do sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. She's a slut. So yes, sex is more open, but it's still the the same uh, patriarchal. It's still idea. bullshit. Okay. It's super patriarchal. Okay. And even like the whole topless thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can be topless. So there's, there's the stigma of breast is just kind of off. Mm -hmm. But that's it. You'll still be harassed in the streets if you're wearing a skirt and like, oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle. Like a lot, like mm -hmm. a lot. When would you say you discovered that you, your body, yourself is not the problem? Um, after I got raped. Took a while. Mm -hmm. Um, but after that happened, It took me like a year to kind of like get a little better. Mm -hmm. And that's when I quit my job, I quit everything. And that's when I started doing art and I started having to question it. And I was like, I can't take, this wasn't, it's like this weird thing because you're like, this was my fault. Mm -hmm. But then you're like, no, it wasn't. And so you start questioning why you feel it's your fault. Mm -hmm. and that's how you start meeting your own patriarchal ways right the voice that gaslights exactly you. so that has been i always say my work is my therapy and image because mm -hmm. i go to therapy and honestly it's like an illustrations of my shit <laughs> like you're real so yeah that's that's mm -hmm. probably when i was like i can't take it anymore like I, it's been too far i almost died from this mm -hmm. it was me trying to get better from it It, it, it went through, I need to question this whole thing. Because mm -hmm. at the end, it didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. The process of healing, the process of unlearning, the process of questioning, the process of reclaiming your power as well. And that's what I find really powerful in your work. Even though it's for yourself, it's therapy, it's the questions that you have in your head. You're still inviting us in. Because I'm doing it in public. Yes. I started doing it in the streets, which bothered people a lot. Mm -hmm. Was there a process for choosing the street as an exhibition, please? Um, it was a pretty naive thinking, to be honest. I was working in an ad agency, you know, I was in the whole system, blah, blah, blah. To me, the street felt like the freest of places. Mm -hmm. It felt free of rules. It felt free of society. It felt outside of everything I knew. Well, it's not really true because there's a ton of rules in the streets and I had to learn them. But still, there's something that is very much outside of society. And I was so angry with society. It didn't feel like home at all anymore. I didn't feel reflected in it at all. That I always say that I started doing my work in the street because it was my way to heal my relationship to society. I needed to mm, see how I wow. felt inside, mm -hmm. outside of myself mm -hmm. because I was starting to question even reality in a way. The, the difference between how I felt and the world was so different that that was those like my work outside are my little bridges to try to stay in society. Mm -hmm. So the street felt like it was the most outside of what I knew and all the rules. I didn't have to ask permission for anyone. It was considered illegal. It was for, like everything that the good girl had to do, mm -hmm. it felt like there it was like a major fuck you to mm -hmm. everything that's how it felt so that's how i chose it right also the the sensor free you don't have to again it's not my stuff till this day gets torn down mm -hmm. written all over but it feels at first it was really hard especially yeah. when i put myself outside but mm -hmm. it was really good it was a good lesson because it forced me to take a distance with my work the second that it was i put it up mm -hmm. it was no longer mine but it's not sensor free you will get taken down and insulted It's also a place, what's interesting with the streets is that I always said that I, I create encounters. You met me, because I would put myself through like real size, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you wanted it or not, you would encounter me. And then your reaction is whatever it is, but I think it's an interesting thing, whatever reaction you have. Because mm -hmm. usually it was, it was rarely neutral. Yeah, what conversation has your work sparked? In the streets, I have met only one man that has seen my work in the streets and been 
like, yes, mm-hmm. this is amazing. Like felt power from it. The thing is, I'm also lucky, I think, that I don't see people won't take that much time to insult me online that much. I'll, I'll have it. Mm-hmm. But to actually have people take the time, people that will say nice things will take more time usually to write you nice things, mm-hmm. which is great <laughs> yes <laughs> so i've had a, a lot of women tell me like when they they saw my stuff it just they it, it, it woke something up because there's something that's very disrespectful of the usual ways it's not disrespectful in general it's just disrespectful of what we're told it's like a scream but it feels like it's screaming for them and i've gotten that a lot from women and And what was interesting, because again, I did that very much in my own little bubble at first. A lot of people and women and non-gender conforming people have, a lot of the people that have reacted very strongly to what I did Mm -hmm. were people that were mostly more in um, less mainstream categories, which was very interesting to me. Um, But a lot of the LGBTQ+, plus, Mm -hmm. a lot of queer, like lesbian women, the non-binary, like really felt the same thing that I felt. Like there was something you saw, so they, f- they felt something that spoke to them. And it, it took me a while to like really kind of understand because we're all so different. Mm-hmm. I loved it, but I didn't necessarily get it. And I think my understanding, I'm not sure that's true, is because you react to your context. Mm-hmm. Context is perceived or real or both. Different people have different contexts. So sometimes someone might f- come across really aggressive or exaggerated and it will happen a lot for example for black women it's because there's a misunderstanding i think of their context of their struggle of their everyday encounters Mm -hmm. and so i think the way i perceived the world and i lived through my world was was a lot i'm oversensitive but also it's been a lot like i I grew up in a very patriarchal sex diminishing shame powerful um, society and culture Mm -hmm. and so it felt really heavy so my screaming is loud Mm -hmm. is exaggerated for a lot of people but for a lot of people that have been going through stuff that is like stronger Mm -hmm. i think it resonated because of that is less tamed a huge thank you to miss me i admire your vulnerability your ability to speak your truth and your strength you can follow her on instagram at miss underscore me underscore art make sure to add her in your favorite because you know censor shit <laughs> uh, and at the art for vandal on twitter you can also buy her merch on her website which is miss me art.com slash shop the pussy luminati shirt that i wear pretty much all the time is from her so you're welcome next week we tackle sexual shame how it may be internalized and how we can overcome it and i'm really looking forward to it as usual have you rated the podcast five stars i think you have by this time but in case you haven't rate the podcast five stars subscribe and also we have some new stuff we are on youtube instagram facebook twitter tiktok and everywhere you listen to your podcast so if you can like engage this is going to help the podcast go further and if you would like to support us we have a paypal that you can find in the show notes just because the show and everything that you see the content everything that is curated for that's exciting is all done voluntarily from your host Yancy um, and that's from crafting the episodes to editing to creating the social media post and all that stuff um, and so I want to keep those conversation going and a little monetary support goes a long way um, but if you're not in a position to do that the liking subscribing engaging with us is really important as well because that's how we can get some deals so first step is rating the podcast leaving every you also and second step would be to subscribe and uh if you want to do the little bonus one we'll be giving a little bit of monetary support which uh it's really appreciated on this lovely note i just want to thank you it is time to say goodbye in the meantime stay curious because that's exciting that's exciting, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah.
before we leave. On production team, recording, editing, and sound design by yours truly, myself, Yancy. Special thanks to Jane P for her assistance on production. The official That's Exciting Anthem by Calder Nash. The amazing vocals on the track by Mel Pacifico. That's all for today's episode. And until next week, stay curious, because that's exciting. Baby, come and me. Oh, I, but you got it so exciting.